It's YouTube week here on The Rubin Report. Karen Strawn is a men's rights activist, a YouTuber, and a mother of three. Karen, welcome to The Rubin Report. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing this morning? I think I'll live. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, check back later. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see if you get through the hour. You got like a little like an allergy situation or something I, going on. Yeah, I, you may have to mute me as I sneeze my head off. You never know, but... Um, yeah. Well, that'll yeah. add that'll add some charm to this for the people who are just going to get to know you for the first time. There you go. It was either that or take a Benadryl and then be like this the whole time. So that also that also could work. You do what you got to do. Let's put it that way. All right. Uh, so. all right. So I'm very excited to talk to you because uh, we've sort of been bouncing around in the same world for quite some time. Um, yeah. uh, but this is the first time we're ever talking, actually. Uh, so first off, men's rights activist. I thought men were privileged and evil. Have I been mistaken this whole time? I'm pretty sure you never actually really thought that, um, at least not the evil part. A lot of people do think that men are privileged, but they do happen to be marginalized in a number of significant ways. And a lot of those uh, issues that they face are actually uh, institutional. Uh, they're in law, they're in policy, um, and uh, in the institution's best practices. And uh, so they're sort of written into the system uh, in, a, in ink. They're not sort of the ephemeral social discrimination that most feminists complain about today that happens to women. Um, you know, there are policies out there uh, concerning domestic violence that essentially train police officers to um, just arrest the man, unless it's really egregious, unless he's got an axe in his thigh or something like that. Right. You remove the man, you don't remove the woman. So um, this is really uh, what I deal with. And a lot of those things um, were implemented uh, through feminist lobbying and feminist efforts at uh, getting laws rewritten, getting policies rewritten and things like that. And um, so sort of over the course of my investigation into all of these problems, uh, I went from being a non-feminist to being antagonistic toward feminism to uh, being now out and out. Uh, I would actually call myself an anti-feminist now. Um, that that would be the priority. Um, you know, men's rights activism comes second to that in a lot of ways. So that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. So I definitely want to dive into some of the, the feminine, the history of feminism and a bit about your evolution and all that. But before we do that, can you give me a couple more examples of the sort of what you would say are, is the systemic discrimination? I get it. There's things in like domestic abuse or in probably divorce cases where generally they're going to be more, uh, lenient with the woman than they would be with the man, that kind of thing. Can you give me a couple of those before we go any further? Well, I mean, a lot of them over Overlap. I mean, with divorce, uh, in so many cases, uh, you'll have a woman who uh, she'll have a lawyer on one side of her and a social worker on another side of her saying, just tell the judge you're scared of him. You don't even have to say he hit you. Mm -hmm. Right. You'll get a restraining order. Um, he'll be out of the house. He won't be allowed to see you or the kids uh, six months from now when it's revisited, then uh the judge will say, well, the children are stable in the sole custody of the mother, and therefore there's no reason to change that. It would cause further upheaval in the children's lives. So so now, therefore, you have the house because that's the residence of the children and you have sole custody of the children. And, you you know, the father um, might have limited access to them, uh, no form of custody whatsoever. So, I mean, it really is this sort of part of the gamesmanship of divorce is the abuse of some of the protections that to put in place um, specifically to protect women from domestic violence. So you have sort of these overlapping problems. Um, and when you look at some of the rhetoric coming out of um, organizations like the National Organization for Women, who, you know, sort of they've described men's rights groups or father's rights groups as an abuser's lobby. Mm -hmm. um, I recall reading uh an article written by a man at the National Organization of Men Against Sexism that essentially said that if the mother doesn't want you to have custody, you should just back off and let her have her way because anything else is abuse. Hmm. And um, 
if you're a man who's actually dealing with an abusive ex-partner who has custody of the kids, what do you do um, in a in a society where so many of the attitudes, uh, at least in terms of uh judges and lawyers and social workers and all of these people who really have a lot of control over your life, um, if they're embracing those attitudes, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? How do you protect your children? How, how do you have any kind of decent life? So Yeah, I'm curious, when did you first realize that this was important to you? As I said at the top, you're a mother of three children. I, I think you're divorced. Am I... I am. Is yeah. that correct? Uh, did that specifically have anything to do with this or was your awakening before then? Or Well, I mean, my, I always kind of knew a lot of this stuff, you know, the stuff you hear about women's oppression and, and particularly about domestic violence being sort of a male on female th- problem. Um, I always knew that was just bullshitty because in my experience at that point, you know, throughout my, you know, 20s and early 30s, uh, I knew more men who were battered by their spouses than women who really? were bat- battered by them, theirs. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and they don't tend to talk about it. Um, they just kind of or they shrug it off. Right. You know, they come in with a big bruise on their face and they're just like, oh, I pissed her off. Right. And uh, are, are there numbers on this that you know of? Because I feel like certain people are going to be listening to this because it almost sounds a little unbelievable. I'm not I'm not saying it's I'm not saying it is unbelievable, but I think a certain amount of people are going to go, wait a minute. How often is a man showing up to work uh, with the bruise because he was hit by his wife? Right. Oh, I, I think that a lot of people would be very, very surprised. Um there is a uh, meta-analysis. It's a huge project. They they analyzed 1,700 different studies on domestic violence, on partner violence, and they found that uh, most of it's something that they would call common couple violence, and most of that is reciprocal. Um, so it's two people beaten on each other, and, and it usually doesn't escalate, and it just has to do with stress or conflict or, you know, people just you know, they have a moment of weakness and they push someone or shove someone or whatever. Right. Right. And, uh, and those generally, I mean, most domestic, most credible domestic violence researchers would say that those require uh, sort of a counseling or public health approach to them rather than a criminal one, because they do tend to de-escalate over time. Uh, people generally learn how to live with each other and get along a little bit better. Um, your mother-in-law is not always visiting. You're not always <laughs> losing your house, right? And those are the situations where these kinds of things come up. Um then of the other cases, the other half, those would be unilateral violence. And some of them are uh, cases of somebody just losing their temper and it wouldn't necessarily follow a pattern of abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, but others are, a smaller percentage of those are what you would really see in a movie like Enough or Sleeping with the Enemy, um, where you just have this ongoing pattern of coercive control and violent Uh, control of a partner and manipulation and all of those things. Mm -hmm. They found that in about 70% of those cases, it's the woman doing it to the man. Wow. Yeah. So when you're looking at really egregious things, like uh, she... Uh, she's mad at him because he's not doing what she wants. And so she pours boiling water on him while he's, while he's sleeping. Right. Um, and I don't know that this is because there's anything intrinsically horrible in women. I I mean, there, I know that there are women out there who have a vicious streak a mile wide, but, um, I think it's more about the fact that we don't ever really socialize girls in the way that we socialize boys in terms of, uh, hitting the opposite sex. I mean, you grew up as a boy, you were told it's never okay to hit a girl, Mm -hmm. right? Specifically a girl. Um, We don't tell girls this about boys. Um, We we tell them don't hit, but we don't ever make a big deal about it if they hit a boy. And in fact, you can see girls on the playground, they'll hit a boy and then they'll say, well, you can't hit me back because I'm a girl. I mean, they know they have carte blanche to do this. Right. Right. So, and then you, and then occasionally you'll see a video. I can think of one particular one in the New York subway. You probably yeah. saw it where this girl kept wailing on this guy and basically was like, you can't hit me. You can't hit me. Then he finally hit her after she yeah. taunted the hell out of him. And, yeah. and then everyone was pissed at him. Yes. 
Oh, of course, of course. There are like you can go on YouTube and just look at social experiments. Uh, you know, just uh, use the search terms "domestic violence social experiment," um, "woman hits man," whatever. You find that when the woman is abusing um, a woman is abusing a man in public, people laugh. They think it's funny. Um, they might look a little uncomfortable. Some of them, like, "Oh, this is none of my business," but they ignore it. Um, in one, there was actually a guy walking by who smacked the guy on the back of the head, like, like help her out, help her out, <laughs> beat on the guy. Right. right. And then you turn it around and you have a guy even just getting menacing with a woman. He hasn't even necessarily laid his hands on her yet. And you already have people just sitting at the alert, like, when when is the point where I have to intervene? Mm-hmm. And then when he does lay his hands on her, they intervene. And in one of these ones, uh, you, you literally had this guy, he was just, he, I guess he took her by the shoulders and he was shaking her and yelling at her and saying, why were you texting that guy or something? And, and these three men just come from three different directions and tackle him. And he ends up on the ground. He's all scabby. And, and, uh, and he had to yell, we're filming, we're filming. This is a social experiment because they were going to kick his ass. Yeah. Do you see yeah. some of this as sort of uh, the phrase that I've been saying in every every week now, which is the road to hell is paved with good intentions, that these people, I think, have some good intentions. So for the example you used at the beginning, where the woman yes. the woman sitting there with the social, uh, the social worker and the lawyer, and they're saying, just say the threat of violence. I mean, I'm sure there are many women out there, and, and probably some men too, that never physically got hit by their spouse, but did have legit, that lived with a certain amount of legitimate, credible threat all the time. So, th- so these people are trying to protect them. Now that doesn't I, mean it's actually working, but I think that the intent is there perhaps. I actually think that, uh, number one, I, I think that it's not generally, uh, probably like that. I think that the more combative, uh, a lawyer in particular, um, manages to turn the situation into the more money he's going to make. So if, if it is not an amicable, agreement to, you know, terms of custody and all of those things, then um, if she makes that move, that's not only going to cause huge problems for him, it's going to make him resent and it's going to turn the entire thing into a long combative process and all the lawyers cash in. This is why you have um, sort of bar associations, associations of family law attorneys, um, sometimes improperly funding lobby efforts to quash alimony reform bills and things like that and shared parenting bills um, because they stand to lose money. The more peaceful a divorce is, the less money these lawyers make. And social workers are often um, sort of ideologically driven uh, in terms of, you know, maybe they took gender studies, maybe they took women's studies, they bought the whole thing, kit and caboodle. They believe that men are the oppressors, women are the oppressed. Um, they believe, and this is actually a theory within feminism, that all female female violence against a male partner is responsive violence, even if it is initiating violence, even if she's hitting first and hitting consistently and hitting constantly, it is what they would call violent resistance against his oppressive controlling behavior that they just assume that he's engaging in. Wow. So that's like some real, like the man has original sin kind of thing. So no matter what he does, even if he does literally nothing, uh, the woman sort of has carte blanche to do whatever she wants. Well, and, and so people people who actually kind of get sucked into this type of ideology, um, whenever you feel really passionately about an ideology, and I'm no different, you're no different, or, or a way of thinking or an idea, um, you want to spread it. You want to convince other people. You want to do, do those things. And so a lot of these people who get really passionate about it, um, they end up in politics. Um, they end up in journalism. They end up in media. They end up in social work. They end up in the law, right? So they end up in all of these places where they can influence the system in order to bring about whatever utopian goals that they have in mind where, you know, the men are no longer the oppressors and everybody's equal and I don't even know what the hell they want. (laughs) But um, so that that's really I think that that's probably more likely to be what's going on there. The laws, I believe, were uh, signed into they were passed into law and the policies were passed as policies or approved as policies, probably with good intentions on the part of politicians. Yeah, the people who wrote those don't necessarily have the best of intentions. 
Yeah, and I always feel like when we're discussing this, or it doesn't have to just be about feminism or men's rights or any of that stuff, but that I try not to demonize everyone's intentions because it, it seems like a lot of my ideological opponents are doing that often, and I try not to do that. But, you're, but what you're saying is, yeah, then you get lawyers mixed up in it, and you get everybody else that wants to make a dime, and then next thing you know, a law that was passed for, for a potentially good reason uh, ends up being pretty crappy. How much of this do you think is just sort of our expectations about men and women in general. So for example, if we took like, you know, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, and if we heard this afternoon that Brad Pitt was beating her for the last year, he would be, you know, kicked out of Hollywood, he would be his career would be ruined, blah blah blah. If we found out that Angelina Jolie was abusing Brad Pitt for the last year, it would be a it would be a running joke amongst everybody. Uh, it would be on you know the front page of the post would have some funny picture of him, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So how much is just about what we expect a, a relationship to be like between men and women? I don't men. think I don't think that that's anything new. Um, I think that um, that these are deeply ingrained these ad attitudes to, uh, towards all of this, and and one of the biggest tricks that feminism has ever pulled, one of the biggest cons, is that they claim to be against those attitudes and those norms, I guess, if you will, um, but they are masters of exploiting them, right? So essentially you, I mean, what is domestic violence legislation that specifically protects women against their male partners? What does that say about men and women? It says that men are strong and women are weak, that men are dangerous, women need protection. These are not new attitudes. Mm -hmm. They're extremely old attitudes. And so they've essentially taken every, every little thing that's sort of maybe part of our uh, biological wetware, and then it, it gets reinforced by uh, by society and acculturation and all those things. Um, they've taken all of those things that are age old that have existed forever, and they've completely exploited them uh, to their own to their own ends. And all the while claiming that they are dismantling all of those norms. And it's it's absolutely ridiculous. It's yeah. It's, it's a mind fuck when you really think about it. <laughs> so, uh, so I started asking you this, and then we kind of we kind of skirted away. So, when your wake up was it? Was it really a personal thing that was happening, or was it just from reading or or something you saw, or what? Oh, the wake up when I actually decided that I had to do something. Um, that was uh, that was actually during my divorce. I had just separated, and I was beginning to realize just how easily I would be able to completely destroy my ex, uh -huh. like absolutely demolish his life. It would have taken very, very little effort on my part. And I was one of those people that I, I wanted to sort of even bend over backwards to be fair with him. And, uh, you know, so I, I, we had sat down and we had written out a temporary separation agreement, you know, that would last one year that assigned custody and gave him generous access whenever he wanted it and all of these things. And uh, that where he would not owe me any child support because I was a higher earner at the time and he was the one that was moving out. He needs to be the one getting on his feet and that we would revisit it after one year. And my lawyer looked at me and said, I want to slap you for signing this. Like, wow. why would you sign this? You could get so much more. And I'm like, why would I, why would I do that? Why, why would I do that? And, uh, and I had chosen my lawyer because he had uh, half of his practice was mediation. Huh. So he wasn't even a family law attorney. He did most of his family law cases. He went, took through mediation. And so it was, I was like, oh, if anybody's not going to be combative, it's this guy, right? It's going to be a nice, easy process, right? But even he was like, you know, I can't believe you would sign away so many of your entitlements. And I'm like, okay. And, uh, wait, so did you, did you sign it as you wanted to, or did you let him influence you? Oh God, no! I was I was essentially okay. Here's how it's going to go. Does this sound fair? And he looked at it and he said, "Yeah, no, that sounds fair." Like that. Like we were just. I mean, he was angry because it was a unilateral decision on my part that right. you know we were going to divorce. But um, so he wasn't pleased with me or anything. But I think he was pleasantly surprised at the fact that I would um, even just offer him, like, just say, "Okay, here's what I think we should do." And he was like, okay, that looks, that looks fine. 
right? Because he had been through a previous divorce and <laughs> had been <laughs> through some stuff, right? right. And he was, he was expecting the worst. And then while I was, um, while during that year between when we separated and when we could actually start finalizing the divorce and, and finish the whole thing, because um, in Canada, you have to be separated for a year unless you have some kind of pressing cause uh, to split up. And um, I stumbled across a men's issues website and it was pretty hardcore. I mean, like a lot of people say a voice for men is like just so misogynistic and angry and all of this, right? But this website was called The Spearhead. It's no, no longer online. It was really hardcore. And I just stumbled in there by accident. And um, I got talking to a lot of the commenters there and reading the articles and they, the articles usually came with lots and lots of citations to research and things like that. And that was, I think, when I realized just how far into the system all of these kind of kooky ideas, these eccentric ideas of, of feminists about how men and women are, had actually gone, right? They, they just kind of got their hooks into the whole thing. And uh, not just in laws, which are actually easier to deal with than policy, because laws um, laws need to be debated. They need to be voted on by elected representatives. They need to uh, pass constitutional challenges, right? There needs to be some kind of public notice that th these laws are under debate. But policies often come through ad hoc committees yeah. and, uh, you know, advisory councils of hand-chosen individuals who all are self-proclaimed experts and uh, who are not elected. And then, you know, some bureaucrat who's also not elected says, well, this looks good and now it's best practices. And those are often much harder to uproot. So once I realized all of this, um, that was when I was just like, you know, somebody's got to actually do something about this. So, yeah. All right. So you, you go down this rabbit hole, you find this information that you feel is, uh, is good and valuable and real, uh, and you have your own awakening. Did you immediately decide, okay, I'm going to be public about this? How quickly did you say, all right, I'm going to start making some videos. I'm really going to start pushing and putting myself out there. Um, well, first off, uh, you know, I sort of fell out of it. I was, uh, I went through a period for about six months where I was working 50, 55 hours a week. So I really didn't have a whole lot of time to, to do other things. But um, once things calmed down in that regard, uh, my the guy that I started dating, he said, oh, well, there's this, this interesting, because he knew we talked very, very clearly and openly about all of this kind of thing. And uh, no less because he had had his own experience with a breakup and losing a child, um, losing complete contact and access to that child and having no rights regarding that, um, that uh, he said, here's this place, you know, that you can discuss this stuff. It was the men's rights subreddit. And um, so I went there and I started commenting and got lots and lots of, I guess they call it karma, um, lots of upvotes and things yeah. like that. And uh, people started recommending that I should be, you know, writing somewhere other than the comment threads on Reddit. So I started a blog and uh, one night while I was at work, my boyfriend emailed, without asking me, emailed my very first blog post to Warren Farrell. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Warren Farrell, but he's so. a best-selling author. About 10, 15 years ago, he was uh, for one of Forbes' top 100 thought leaders in the world. Um, he is, I don't know whether he considers himself a men's rights activist now, but he's written several books, Father and Child Reunion, uh, used to be a big feminist. Um, the myth of male power, right? Got booted from the National Organization for Women for uh, being a bad feminist and all of that because he tried to present the male side of things. Right. And um, so this was a big, big name in the sort of the whole area. And uh, I was so mad at him. And then half an hour later, I get an email from Warren Farrell saying that was really great, right? Wow. And that egged me on and it spurred me on. And 
And what got me doing videos was all of the accusations from feminists that I obviously am a man. You are obviously a man, <laughs> probably a fat, ugly, neck bearded one who can't get laid because no woman would think the way you do. And so I just came out on camera. And then I got popular. I got really popular from there. Right. So when you put yourself out there for that moment, you're suddenly, uh, this has been a theme with all of the people that I'm interviewing for YouTube, because I don't think that necessarily any any of us are the only person out there thinking the things that we're thinking, but there are a select group of us that put ourselves out there and then we you know, we get some of the accolades and some of the crap for doing so. When you put yourself out there and you got all that nice feedback, but of course you're getting some bad stuff too, how does that affect you in general? Just being part of the social media part of this, the comments, all of that stuff. Because I think for everybody I've been talking to, there is a certain toll that it takes. Uh, it's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, like you, you always have this this pressure, especially when you're, when your audience is is comprised of men who have you know often been you know had their lives turned upside down or they've uh, they've been wrongfully accused of something or or what like some of these things that that these men have gone through that have contacted me are really really egregious they're just absolutely devastating and so there's this responsibility that that you feel to not want to say anything that might upset them, mm -hmm. um, even if it's a truth that needs to be told. Uh, you definitely don't want to say something in in an insensitive way that would upset them. Uh, I absolutely have no problem offending feminists. I, you know, I get the drive by comments. I get them calling me names. I get them occasionally sending me threats. Um, does not bother me. It, it doesn't. I mean, I, that that kind of thing never has bothered me, um, and uh, and a lot of insults from them. You know, like you look like a man, and obviously I know why you do this because you're ugly, and you this is the only way you can attract men, and all kinds of really sexist things, right? Like things that if you said that about a feminist, that you're ugly and you know you can't attract a man, and that's why you're a feminist, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> But somehow they're they're the tolerant ones, you know. They're they're the tolerant. Ones. I mean, there is an aspect of that. You know, I was just discussing this yesterday with somebody online, and you know, like a lot of people on sort of my side of things, sort of the men's rights or anti-feminist, anti-SJW side of things, have made the claim that you know SJWs do it way more. Uh, you know, they do the insults and the, the vitriol and, and the threats and, and things like that. They do it way more than we do. I don't know if that's true because there is that difference in how the impact that it has when it's, when it's a right, what you would consider to be a righteous target. Mm -hmm. And when it's someone coming at you or one of your friends or, or colleagues or associates. So, I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I would have to actually see some hard data on that in order to be able to really justify saying that uh, they are less tolerant than, you know, the people who watch my videos or whatever, right? Right. We, we all want to believe that our audience is the most tolerant. I, I, think I've, I think I've built a pretty tolerant audience, which is why I can tell that, you know, I got Clinton supporters, I got Trump supporters, I got Gary Johnson supporters, I got anarchists and, and everything. But yes, everybody picks their thing to be offended over. I'm curious, I, I've noticed that uh, when sometimes I get criticism, people say, well, Dave, you're, you're a liberal, but you spend a lot of time criticizing the regressive left. Does that mean you're, you're giving the right a free pass? And I, my argument back is, well, I'm trying to clean up my house. Everyone attacks the right, left, and right. No yeah. pun intended. Everyone, yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's turn like on... Yeah, turn on The Daily Show or any other show. They're always attacking the right. Okay, we get it. That's fine. But I'm trying to clean up my guys. I don't know if it's working or not, but that's what I'm trying to do. Do you ever feel the same thing that if you spend so much time doing what you do that you might ultimately be giving an easy pass to the, to the uh, people that would be uh, doing things to women that, uh, that you wouldn't want done? Um, you know, honestly, I don't I don't know that that is necessarily even possible. I mean, I think we all get that uh, sick feeling in our gut when we see a man hit a woman. 
um, that just isn't there when we see the opposite. I think that we all sort of have uh, sort of a natural fail safe in terms of um, egregious abuses against women. Um, you even look at something like, I don't know if you remember this, the Egyptian woman in the blue bra. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And there Wait, can were, you can you explain that for people that, uh, that don't know? Uh, okay, so it was it was uh, in Egypt. There's a big protest. Uh, the police were coming in, beating the protesters. Um, there were like hundreds of protesters, dozens of them being beaten. And there was one woman in a burqa and she was being beaten quite severely. And then her garment fell open, revealing this blue bra. And everybody was outraged. The UN uh, expressed concern that the Egyptian police were now targeting women specifically. Um, the Egyptian women uh, came out of their homes for the first time, sort of en masse, and held a protest march, chanting, drag me, strip me, my brother's blood will cover me, all of these things, right? And it was all about the fact that this one woman was beaten so severely. And and I'm looking at this film and I'm trying to divorce my emotions from it and really see what's going on. And what I'm seeing is all of these men getting the shit beat out of them. And one about maybe eight feet away from her getting a much more severe stomping by police. And the moment her, her garment falls open and the cops realize that there's actually a woman under there mm -hmm. because they have had problems with men dressing as women because when you dress as a woman, you're immune from that kind of thing um, in a lot of cases, right? That kind of violence that's targeting males specifically. Yeah. There's violence that targets women more than males. But yeah, Not to say um, that the women in burqas in the Middle East aren't getting subjected yeah. to all kinds of violence. Of course. There is specific vi types of violence that will target men more than women and women more, more than men. And police violence tends to target men more than women. And um, what happened when they noticed that she was a woman was they immediately moved to cover her up. And one of the cops was sort of in the process of lifting his foot up to, to kick her. And another cop pushed him away. And then they carried her out of the camera's view. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, so, and everybody else is still getting beaten, right? So she was actually, once they realized she was a woman, they stopped beating her. And I'm thinking, and everybody is somehow losing their minds over this, right? So I really don't think that we're in danger of that kind of thing, that kind of insensitivity towards things that affect women in, in negative ways. Um, I think that we're, I think that we're actually never going to get to the point where we're as sensitive about negative impacts on men as we are about women. No matter how much men's rights activism there is, no matter how much anti-feminism there is, um, I don't think we're ever going to have that same sort of brainstem rationale in our in our system that tells us that harming women is is wrong and harming men eh, maybe it's okay so is that do you think that's really ultimately just evolution because as you said before there's a gut reaction if you saw a man hit a woman there's a gut reaction the men were the hunters and gatherers the women were taking care of the home there is just something built into our our DNA, our cosmic ooze at this point, that you can you can explain as much of this as you can in a rational sense, but you can never overcome what is sort of built into us. I, I do think so. Um, like when, when you look at, uh, it's not so much the hunter-gatherer part of things, although that does necessitate you being willing to subject your men and your young men to higher levels of risk of in injury and death than you are. And that makes perfect sense in terms of, you know, reproductive strategies and, and things like that. You keep, you keep your uteruses safe um, because that's the future. That's your children. Right. And a woman is not just a woman. She is a woman plus every child she will ever bear. Right. So there's that calculation in our DNA. And then on top of that, it's the warrior aspect as well. Uh, you would not be able to convince men to bash each other's brains out to protect women and children if men had a natural uh, impulse toward sympathy, empathy, compassion toward other men the way they do with women and children. You just wouldn't be able to do it. That mm. would have had to have been selected out uh, in order for men to have played that 
particular role as long as they have, which is oh, six, eight, ten million years long before we were even hominids. Right. So you're so you're acknowledging you can't sort of beat our evolution in your argument, but you can do your best within the constructs of intellectualism or something. Problem a little bit, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hope, I guess that's that's the hope. Um, really quick, backing up to, to the woman in Egypt, uh, one of the things that I've seen in the last year or so uh, related to feminism is its utter failure in, in mainstream feminism to defend all of these women, especially across the Middle East, but, but we see plenty of them in Europe too, that are, that are in these burqas uh, and that are basically covered head to toe. You can see a slit of their eyes. I've seen videos. I've seen videos in Saudi Arabia of them being beaten in malls, in public places by strangers. Yep. They can't drive separately. They have to be out with a male that's accompanying them, all of these horrible things. And this is something that modern mainstream feminism seems to utterly utterly ignore. So in the case of the woman in Egypt, they ignored the woman in Egypt in the burqa until that event happened, and yeah. then they got outraged, but they didn't seem to care about her life before that. What, what do you make of that? Um, well, I don't, I don't think that they are necessarily, uh, because I, I would actually take the approach of, uh, it's not necessarily something that we should be sticking our nose into. And I know that's going to sound like cultural relativism, but it's n not really cultural relativism. It's that most people aren't educated about other aspects of cultural practices and traditions in within Islam, that if we were to liberate women without touching the male half of the equation, um, we would end up with something really, really, really awful. Um, you know, like when a woman in under Sharia, yeah. a woman has uh, the right to a, a bride gift. It's called the Mar or Maria sometimes. And uh, this is her money. Um, she holds any property that she owns, uh, her husband can't touch. Any income that she earns, her husband can't touch. He is the provider, the entire provider for the family, unless between the two of them, they negotiate something different. So she has this, it's a paper debt for the most part. So it might be $50,000, right, um, that he has pledged to pay. This is her security. This is what she gets if anything happens to him. He dies or whatever. Out of his estate is first paid this the remainder of this gift, right? So she might get $4,000 in gold coins to begin with, and the rest of it is on paper, and she can call it in at any time. Uh, if she divorces with cause, she gets all of the, the entire payout plus alimony. Um, and uh, she has an entitlement to be supported uh, by his income alone. And so she doesn't, if she has income, she doesn't even need to spend it on herself. So... Of course, she's going to need his permission to go out and work because working requires daycare and working requires uh, transportation and working requires all kinds of other expenses. It costs money to work. There's an investment involved there. And if those become necessities, he's responsible for paying them. Right. So they have to negotiate something like she would have to say to him, maybe uh, maybe he might not give permission no matter what. But I know several Muslim Muslim couples in Canada who do live by these customs. It's not law here, but they live, they choose to live by these customs and they negotiated. And he said, yes, you can go out and get a job. Um, but but I do, I, I'm confused, though. Are you uh, sorry? Go ahead. He says, I do want to pay for all of the household expenses, but if if you need daycare to work or if you need new clothes to work or if you need a car to work, I would like that to come out of your pay and not mine. I don't want to have to get a second job to subsidize your ability to go out of the house and work, right? So those kinds of things, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, and actually one of them, he's from Lebanon, he told me, because he just contracted to marry and he just signed the dotted line on his uh, bride gift on the on the Maria, which was, I think in his case, it was $35,000. Um, he said that if his wife chooses to, uh, when they have children, because he's responsible for feeding and sheltering the whole family, she can demand a wage from him for breastfeeding their own child, right? So, I mean, there are some things that w we in the West haven't looked at that if we 
say to women, you don't have to live under the authority of your husband, you can go out and get a job. If we don't ha- do something to amend his obligations, his financial obligations to her, he's going to end up having to take a second job in order to pay for her driving to and from work and pay for her wardrobe and pay for the daycare and all of those things. And she gets to just keep all that money to herself, right? So I don't think, I think that these things definitely need to change. I absolutely do. I think feminism I think you you guys need to stop encouraging feminism to go in there and stick their noses in and because if they do it they're going to bung it up. So if the so okay okay so uh, so you're not fully down with everything that you just said. Oh, you're what? just saying you're just saying this is a thing that exists. Yeah. And and that feminism as it exists is not the thing to fix this. It's not the solution. No, it is not. So then, then what is the solution for the average person that I look, I think that if you see a woman in a burqa, I would venture to say that 99 out of a hundred times, that is not ultimately her choice. This is not a person ultimately living their authentic self, because if it was, if it wasn't about empower, you know, power over the woman, you'd see a lot of men in burqas, but you don't, you see women in burqas. So what, what is it that the outsider can do? I, I get why you're saying feminism as it is would screw it up. Because they yeah. they flip the power dynamic and then completely that's no good too. But what can we do when we see, you know, as Bill Maher says, if you cover up all your women and you hang gays, that's fertile ground for terrorism. Because if you're not getting laid and you can't see women and blah blah blah. So what do we as outsiders that care about these people, these women, what do we do? Well, I think I think we need to start caring about everybody and not just the women. I think we, we need to start caring about the 95% of sex workers in Afghanistan who are boys. We need to start worrying about the 95% of child laborers in Afghanistan who are boys, many of them working to support their mothers and their sisters. Um, so you have to actually take a, an, a holistic approach and look at the entirety of the problem. I remember reading an article years ago um, where they were interviewing women uh, in Afghanistan who were furious um, at the West. Um, they said, what you're doing, right, you are giving all of this help and all of this education and all of this aid and all of this support to women and girls, and you are abandoning our men and our boys. And what is it that you want? Do you want them to all sicken and die? And then it's going to be up to the women and girls alone to rebuild our country. Mm -hmm. We need to actually take a look at the entire thing, right? And that means that we need to acknowledge that there are some benefits to being a woman under Islam. There are some benefits to being a man. There are some disadvantages, some of them very extreme to being a woman under Islam, and some of the exact same thing to being a man. That these are two groups of people who have different sets of rights, privileges, obligations, and entitlements, and that they are those two sets of how things are done were developed in a complementary fashion. So when you fuck with one side without adjusting the other, then you end up with a massive, massive source of injustice. So what we need to actually be doing is we need to be caring about all people in the Middle East, including the men, including the boys. Um, when, when you hear, I mean, you think, okay, so you see a woman being beaten in a burqa. Well, you know, last I checked, the, the U.S. military wasn't firing soldiers for defending those women, mm-hmm. but they were firing soldiers for defending an eight-year-old boy who was being repeatedly raped night after night, right? Right. And I, I get what you're saying. Look, if you treat the women better, if you get, if the women have pure equality, that comes with more equality for the men. It, it, these two things are totally, yes. totally symbiotic. Okay, so all that said, what do you make of what seems to be the strange relationship that is mocked all the time on YouTube, the strange relationship between feminism and Islam? And Because I think the, the best example of this would be uh, in Germany, in Cologne, the New Year's attacks, where it was known that these were migrant men. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't know that they were doing these attacks in the name of Islam. They happened to be Muslim, but they were new people in a, in a Western society that hadn't been Westernized. And yep. almost all, 
almost all of the left-wing media and certainly all the big feminists that I know of online, all were attacking, basically attacking the women for not understanding. They refused to attack either the men themselves. I kept saying, I, only, I don't blame an entire religion. I blame the men specifically that did this and the ideology that they did it for. Uh, but it was almost everything backwards. It got Richard Dawkins into a lot of trouble because there was that feminism. I'm sure you saw that cartoon, the feminism Islamism thing that Sargon of Akkad retweeted. Um, wh what is just, that? What? what is that? The most illiberal ideology is what feminists have put at the top of their oppression Olympics. You know, I I don't know. You know, I think I think maybe they just want to ignore uh, all of that inconvenient stuff that's going on within Islam, um, because they really I think their main focus is to bash their own men. That's that's really what they want. I mean, you even oh, who was it? Was it Jess Phillips or something? She said uh, that. Oh, Cologne, what happened in Cologne? It's no different than your average Saturday night on Broad Street. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and I'm like, what? Um, they they really, they don't want any of the focus taken off of their own men. I don't think that they see any, there's a huge will to power within feminism, within movement feminism, institutional, sort of academic, scholarly feminism. Um, there's a... A, uh, a, a striving toward power, a striving toward control, a striving to, and they don't care what's going on over there. They want, you even look at, they care much more about the number of women in Congress than they care about the everyday problems of the 80% of women out there who are not feminists. Right. Or they're not careerists. They, 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 they aren't they don't think like these women do, because, you know, we don't have big, exciting careers. We have jobs. Mm -hmm. right? And when you work at a Tim Hortons or a McDonald's or cleaning somebody's toilets, it's inevitable that you would rather have less workforce participation, if possible, rather than more, which means that you need strong families and you need a strong partnership with a man who can help pay the bills and run the household and all of those things. And so you don't see marriage as sub subjugation of women. You don't see marriage as your own enslavement. You don't see any of these things the way these women see them. These women, they're mostly elitists. They're mostly highly educated, uh, middle-class, upper-middle-class women. This has always been the case, all the way since the suffragettes. And they have a completely different set of values. And when they're looking at the men in their lives, they're seeing... Men like Bill Clinton, they're seeing men like, you know, one of the most telling things that I think experiences for me was sitting next to Naomi Wolf mm -hmm. on a panel. And she said, well, I don't know what world you're living in. None of the men I know, none, none of the people I know among my friends could get away with denying their, or the women I know, could get away with denying their husbands access to the children. And I said, but you're wealthy. Right. I mean, like when you have a net worth of three million dollars, right, you can afford as a man to engage the system constantly, mm -hmm. go constantly to reinforce your rights. And your wife knows this, your ex-wife knows this. And so she doesn't mess with your access. She doesn't mess with your custody. Right. She was so offended by me saying she was wealthy. She was like, how dare you? You don't know anything about me. I am not wealthy. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, she's not wealthy. Right, she's married to a Clinton speechwriter. Like, what universe is she living in? Right, I'm, I was a waitress at the time. Yeah, what does that tell you really about that type of thinking? Because ultimately what you were able to offend her with was telling her, that she she's her. rich. Somehow that now, yeah, that is actually more offensive. Acknowledging that you've become successful, which is what most of us would like to do, right? Yeah. Most of us would like to be successful. But by you saying you've become successful, so the system now is able to work in your favor, depending on how much money you have, which everyone, no one doesn't acknowledge this, uh, that was the most offensive thing to her. Oh, yeah. Well, because, because it's an indication that she has privilege. Right. And when you're 
you know, when you buy into the whole progressive stack thing, you know, when you have privilege, you go to the back of the line and you get to be the last person to speak. Yeah. But not only that, um, she, wealth is one of the most obvious privileges out there. I mean, we have this murky woo woo concept in feminism called male privilege, right? Male privilege oh, it has its downsides and it backfires and it hurts men too. And, you know, we need to get rid of male privilege because of not just because of the ways it harms women, but because of the ways it harms men. Right. Okay. Would anybody say this about being wealthy? <laughs> right. I would argue that being wealthy is the one privilege that's actually legit because it's, it's completely it's, uncomplicated. Right. It's acquired. So and it, you don't have to do any mental gymnastics to, to actually prove its existence. <laughs> you don't have to say, oh, well, money hurts people in this way, but really it's a privilege to have it. No, um, no, it's, it's, it's the only real privilege that there is. And she's soaking in it. And uh, Madge, you're soaking in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, that is something that unless she flat out denies it, there's, there's no way to defend herself against that. Yeah. So speaking of the whole social justice movement, regardless of whether we're talking about Black Lives Matter or feminism or whatever there is, for all of us, uh, and this has been a through line for all the people I'm talking to this week for YouTube week, for all of us that are fighting this idea of being you know, judged as groups and not as individuals and all of this stuff, and as someone that puts your stuff out there to fight this, what do you think is the best way for the average person watching this to fight these ideas? Give yourself moral permission to think the way you already think. This is really the big the big thing that I have. Because when I talk, I talk about this freely, in public, openly. The moment I came out under my real name, I had to inform my bosses of what I did to prepare them for any kind of onslaught of phone calls demanding they fire me or something, or a picket line or something. Um, so... That At that point, when they seemed completely unfazed for the most part, like completely didn't bother them, um, and two, two of them, one of them was a woman, expressed extreme interest. Uh, the woman was uh, almost in tears saying, I'm just so grateful there's somebody out there doing this. Wow. And then months later, I found out why she was so emotional, and it was because her son was on trial on felony harassment charges against his, he was 18. He'd broken up with his girlfriend because he caught her cheating. And the only evidence in the case at all was the hundreds of texts and emails and voicemails and things like that, that she had made to him that he, thank God he kept them all. Right. Because it went to court. And the moment that these things were presented to the judge, the judge just dismissed the case, he said like, why are you even like, how did this even make it into my courtroom? Um, she was stalking him. But she couldn't, felt like she couldn't tell anybody that her family was going through this um, at the time. But she was so, just like, so emotional. And then she told me about it afterwards, uh, after he had, after the case was dismissed. And I was just like, oh my God, like, what a horrible thing to go through. And uh, so essentially, Every time I go to the you know grocery store and I'm standing in line, I get chatting with someone, anybody asks me what I do, I just come out and tell them I'm an anti-feminist, right? And I just, I don't act ashamed about it. And I explain, they're curious, I explain why. And when I do, they say, oh yeah, no, my brother-in-law is going through something like that. And there you go. Like, they, they don't, they're quiet about it. They don't talk about it. Maybe they feel ashamed thinking that the system is, is wrong or or unjust or whatever. Um, and that's because the mainstream media, all it wants to talk about is how great feminism is and, and all of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they gatekeep like mad in terms of, you know, The Guardian and places like that, and HuffPo and, and things like that. They gatekeep like mad in terms of what is presented to the public. That's the Overton window is what's presented in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So all I have to do is shift that a little bit, me and people like me, and then all of a sudden people find themselves going, you know, I always actually kind of thought this way, but I always was told that it was wrong, and I guess maybe it's not. 
And that's sort of the job that we have to do, just convince people they're not bad people for thinking the way they think. Yeah, I love the phrase you said there, which was give yourself the moral authority. It's like all these people... Yeah, all these people are always trying to moralize us. Well, not, why not moralize yourself and, and push your ideas? So, all right, so I have to end with uh, with one final question, uh, which is you were once interviewed by my former boss, uh, Jank over at the Young Turks. And I guess the question that is uh, the burning question on most people's minds is, did you ever make him that ham sandwich? No, I haven't yet, but I do have plans to. Um, it won't just be ham. It will be several meats, some nice. artisans, uh, many, many types of wonderful things that grow in the ground, harvested at their peak freshness, <laughs> pressed between two lightly grilled pieces of fresh baked bread. And then I will wrap it up and put it in the mail for Jink. Well, that is very exciting, and I hope there is a video of him opening that. Well, Karen, it really it was a pleasure talking to you. I knew I was going to enjoy this one, and I fully did. Uh, so I want to thank Karen Strawn for joining me on The Rubin Report for our big YouTube week, and you can check out her channel at youtube.com slash girlwriteswhat, and the link is right down below. 